I can't think of a more bullish setup for precious metals than what we're seeing today. When fund managers realize, okay, wait, the Fed can't raise interest rates, and so interest rates can't go higher, that's super bullish for precious metals. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, November 7th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, November 7th, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. As always, if you are new to our channel or if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe, hit the bell to be notified of new updates, and give us a thumbs up. If you like what we do, we truly do appreciate your support. Jesse Felder, founder, editor, and publisher of the Felder Report, joins us once again today. Jesse began his professional career at Bear Stearns and later co-founded a multi-billion dollar hedge fund firm headquartered in Santa Monica, California. Since moving to Bend, Oregon in 2000 and founding the Felder Report shortly thereafter, his writing and research has been featured in major publications and websites like the Wall Street Journal, Barron's, Yahoo Finance, Business Insider, Real Vision, Investing.com, and more. Jesse also hosts and produces the Super Investors, and the Art of Worldly Wisdom podcast. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Jesse Felder. Jesse, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me back. Great. Glad to have you back, Jesse. It's been a while. Jesse, you wrote in a recent article on the Felder Report asking, where are we in the market cycle? Today's stock indices are still either at record highs or at extreme highs, and they seem invincible climbing higher year after year. What motivated you to ask that question about where are we in the market cycle or where we are in the market cycle and which markets were you focused on? Well, I was mainly focused on the, on the stock market. Um, I think that, uh, you know, the sentiment cycle is something that's, you know, very important to pay close attention to. I think Howard Marks said, you know, we can't really, um, you know, time the market uh, perfectly, but we can take the market's temperature, and 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 in doing that, you're basically trying to understand, you know, where we are in that in that sentiment cycle. Are people, um, you know, pessimistic and fearful, or are they on the opposite side of the spectrum, euphoric, and uh, uh, you know, um, uh, expressing that through leverage in different different ways, and and that would suggest we're closer to the end of the cycle. And I think you know we saw uh, an extreme in sentiment back in January, February of this year, when the GameStop saga happened. And uh, I think it was an astounding number. I think it was something like 900,000 separate accounts uh, were trading GameStop in one day at the very peak is what the SEC found. And around that time, we saw a bunch of other signals um, peak and, and roll over. And that would be, you know, like call options activity and just... Um, another one that I look at would be the, the ratio of NASDAQ volume to NYSE volume. That was another one that just exploded higher. So to me, there are a lot of signs. We saw this euphoric sentiment extreme peak back in January and February. To me, that was it's, it's very similar to what we saw in 2000 at the peak of the dot-com mania when the NASDAQ blew off in March of that year and then rolled over into uh, pretty much a bear market at that time. In September of 2000, we saw the NYSE composite go on to make a new high, and that kind of made people feel better about, okay, maybe the total market's not rolling over into a bear market. Um, but shortly after that, in the late 2000, we saw the, the, the market roll over. And I think it was really important in the fall of that year that we didn't see speculative activity, speculative activity resurge in a way that would be supportive of, of new highs in the stock market broadly. And I think that's potentially what we're seeing today, where we saw speculative activity peak back in the, in the spring, uh, late winter. And the Russell 2000's gone sideways since then, hasn't made new highs, even though other markets have. So we're potentially in a, in a time period now where if speculative activity doesn't return in a big way, that's probably bad news for the overall stock market. You also tweeted out a chart of the market cycle showing how sentiments follow a pattern from optimism to euphoria as the cycle peaks and then into fear and despondency as the market bottoms out. How accurate would you say this market cycle pattern is? 
I mean, isn't it showing sentiments which are often not quantifiable? Absolutely. I mean, you know, when we're talking about sentiment, you're a lot of the times talking about um, anecdotal evidence. And, and it's obviously very difficult to to track because uh, or, or to, to quantify. Um, but still, I think, you know, it's important to try and, and, and take the market's temperature in that way, because uh, I do think it's important to, <clears throat> as Warren Buffett has said, try and be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. That to me, that is the only kind of sane way to approach a market that's driven by by human emotions. And if you just try and do that in a general way, I think it's it's helpful. You know, uh, another way that I love to think of it, I think I even prefer John Templeton's way of framing it. But when, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna botch the the quote. But when he says, uh, you know, help people, when people are panicking to sell, help them out and buy. And when people are panicking to buy, help them out and sell. And I think to have that kind of a contrarian mindset in a broad sense uh, makes, you know, it, it's helpful to you in the long run. I think if you, you know, had followed that, you would have been a buyer in 2009, 10, you know, at the, the stock market lows uh, a little over a decade ago. And you'd probably be, you know, selling today or at least reducing exposure today. And that's not necessarily to try and time the market perfectly. It's just to to say, you know, it's uh, it's a little safer to be aggressive when when most people are 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 very fearful. And it's probably time to be a little bit more cautious when people are are um, euphoric. Yeah, Jesse, how are these markets at extreme highs supported? Well, I, I think, you know, it, it, that's a very good question. There's there's obviously a lot of different supports. And I would say, you know, the two things I pay mo closest attention to. Um, one of the fun things I did this summer was I, I went out on a, on a road trip and went and, and uh, interviewed people directly uh, that, I, that I've wanted to, you know, face to face in terms of, uh, you know, getting together. I think uh, COVID has, you know, locked us down. <laughs> you know, had to do things virtually like this, which, you know, I really enjoy doing. There's really nothing like getting together face to face with people like Michael Oliver, who's just a technical specialist who I met with in, in Colorado. And I went to go see uh, uh, Jim Stack up in Montana, who is one of the smartest, you know, minds that I've found. And, and he studied markets for years, going back to Marty Zweig's, you know, philosophy. And, you know, one of the things he kind of reinforced to me was that the two things to pay closest attention to are uh, technicals and monetary policy. So technicals in terms of what, how, what is the stock market doing, but also what is the underlying breadth look like? Is it is it strong or is it is it uh, potentially weakening? Because I think that breadth can help you understand where you are in terms of that trend. A healthy trend is a very strong breadth. That's not something you want to fade, but. Later on in the trend, when it's getting closer to reversal, you'll find fewer and fewer stocks powering the market higher. And those signs of, of waning breath are a pretty good signal that it's time to become cautious relative to that trend. I think we've seen those over the, I, you know, one of the other posts that I wrote uh, in the last month or two was uh, just about the number of Hindenburg omens that we've seen triggered on the NASDAQ. I think we had 10 or 11 of them trigger in a six month period, which is just a sign that breath is really dramatically waning in the NASDAQ. You're having a number of, even as that index was kind of hitting new highs, you're having a number of new lows within the index um, being triggered. Uh, and that shouldn't happen, you know, in a strong uptrend. Um, there's other signs, percent of stocks trading over their 50 or 200 day moving averages. Those have been actually heading south as markets have been heading higher, another potential breath warning. But the other side of this is monetary policy. So long as the Fed is supporting markets, it's really tough to be bearish. But uh, I think that's another thing we're, sh we're seeing shift over the last few months. The Fed has made it clear, okay, uh, it looks like we've seen a number of Fed heads come out and say, it looks like inflation's proving to be not transitory. And if that's the case, then they are woefully behind the curve. And they're going to have to taper asset purchases and raise interest rates. And so when you have that, the technical signs pointing to a weakening, uh, weakening breadth, a weakening uh, trend, uptrend, at the same time monetary policy is shifting, to me those are signs it's time to be cautious. Okay, and where the Fed is ahead of the curve, a few of their top people, including Fed Chairman Jerome Powell, 
they've been trading the markets, buying and selling at just the right times. What do we make of this? Is this right? Well, I mean, it's obviously a huge conflict. And um, I, I think, you know, they're going to rectify this. I think the Fed just announced they're going to, you know, create a, a blackout window similar to what, you know, insiders are forced to do around earnings windows and these types of things. Insiders, you know, corporate executives are prohibited from trading during those windows. And the Fed, you know, it sounds like the Fed's going to implement something similar to where, you know, around Fed meetings, you know, they have, a, they have a blackout window where they're not allowed to trade. I mean, personally, I think they should not be allowed to, to manage their own investments at all while they're sitting on the on on the, the FOMC or even on any of the, the Fed Fed boards. Um, you know, but but we'll see. I, I think the more important um, discussion probably in this regard is what are the consequences? Is this controversy enough for Jerome Powell to lose his job? Um, and if he if he does and he's replaced with somebody even more dovish, that has really important implications for the asset markets. That's a good point. You know, Jesse, with regards to that Robin Hood phenomenon that you touched on a little bit earlier, what do you make of the developments where the lines between investing and gambling have sort of blurred, given that the ease of buying and selling stocks from an app on the phone has has become something that just about anyone can do? Well, I mean, th this market over the last 18 months has reminded me for the first time in 20 years uh, of the dot-com mania. Uh, for me, I was the, the head trader of a hedge fund, um, you know, the chief options, op you know, uh, officer of, of, of our firm, our, our brokerage firm, um, back in the late 90s. Uh, so I had a front row seat to the dot-com mania and seeing individual investors, kind of really what it did to indiv individual investors. And really, over the you know this market over the last eighteen months is the first time I've really been reminded of that period where you've had so many people um, really feel the fear of missing out on something massive, on the opportunity to to trade their own portfolio to massive riches. And the the mindset isn't I'm you know I want to make ten fifteen percent a year. I want to I want to make a hundred two hundred percent per year. And you really only see that when you're getting very close to the peak of a, of a mania in, in an asset market. And I, and I think that's absolutely what we're seeing with the rise of Robin Hood and, uh, you know, trading in a lot of these incredibly speculative names. I mean, Plug Power is one. In the late 1990s, I saw just explode higher in price and then go down 99% in the crash. Again, plug power. We saw, you know, this this highly speculative business that may never ever turn a profit. Um, you know, saw increase, you know, a thousand percent, you know, uh, increase in in price over, you know, uh, over a period of time, driven by retail investors. And uh, you know, I think th those stocks uh, are sp especially vulnerable to this reversal in sentiment, or at least even just a petering out in sentiment. Uh, you know, this, this market has been, you know, propped up uh, by, uh, by a lot of this speculative activity, which is driven by leverage in a way we've never seen before. We've never seen uh, a bull market that's so highly dependent on margin debt, on leverage ETFs, and on call options. You know, I mean, there's this this options, uh, you know, cycle we can get into if you want, but it become it becomes it creates a virtuous cycle where call option buying creates higher prices, which you know inspires more call option buying, and so the market is underpinned by all this leverage, uh, driven by by you know in a great to a great extent by retail, and Robinhood has made that so much easier for investors to use leverage and use call options. It's I think there's going to be on the other side of this thing. There's going to be, uh, you know, congressional hearings about should this have ever been allowed in the first place. That uh, call option cycle that you just spoke about. Do you think it's going to continue to to grow? 
Well, I think, you know, when you look at call options volumes, then it's one of these indicators I've been paying really close attention to because I think for the market to make sustainable new highs, you're going to need more call options buying because that's really one of the things that's driven prices. Uh, and it's amazing to me to see a stock like Tesla. Uh, you know, I really do believe Tesla has been driven higher. The price has been dri driven higher by this virtual cycle in call options buying. What happens is, Individual investors go buy literally weekly call options that expire on Friday, and they're far out of the money. You know, they're probably 20, 30% out of the money. But if they buy enough, and this is what happened in GameStop, AMC, a lot of these stocks, if they buy enough of them, it forces market makers to go into the market who are short now, short calls, because they've come, they've taken the other side of that trade for the call buyers. They're now short calls. They have to go buy under the, the common stock in order to hedge that short call position. So that creates a huge amount of demand with a, with a, a tiny little bit of a capital. These traders can, can create a huge amount of buying on the part of market makers, which really drives the price a lot higher. And they can leverage up those calls by more, and it, and it just creates, I, I think, we're gonna look back at the bubble in Tesla as the, you know, probably the poster child for this call option mania. And, uh, if that amount of call buying doesn't continue, you wonder, you know, does the floor fall out from underneath a lot of these stocks? How much selling would it take for these things to give back all their gains? And I think it's an open question. Yeah, you know, it's pretty interesting because the, the way it sounds to me is the company actually may not even matter that much anymore. It's about how to make money over or under that company. Absolutely. I mean, you know, it's it's been fascinating to see you know like a stock like AMC right it's a dying business um, I just watched uh, Dune last night great movie came out simultaneously in theaters and on HBO Max and uh, you know I I don't know why you'd be betting on uh, a movie theater company going to a hundred thousand dollars per share which is what a lot of the AMC apes are talking about. When in order for that to happen, AMC would have to be more valuable than the entire stock market. <laughs> it's just the, 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 the ideas behind some of these trades are, are so uh, asinine uh, that they're, they're, uh, they're literally impossible. And at the same time, you have, you know, the new Bond film came out just in the theaters and still it disappointed. I mean, it, it, it and so the theater business is is a, is a dying business and it should be you know uh, the focus of short sellers um but the stock has gone up you know ten thousand percent or something uh this year because of this call option buying so you're absolutely right it has nothing to do with the business it has everything to do with you know the, the these uh you know reddit wall street bets um you know groups coordinating call option buying to try and, and uh, you know, uh, for whatever the end purpose is. And I know a lot of them talked about uh, maybe screwing over hedge funds that are, you know, short selling and, and, and hurt, you know, in their view, hurting these businesses. Um, but it, it, it's really, you know, I, I think just a function of, of greed and, and uh, you know, the, the age old thing that we've seen in speculative manias throughout history. You know, Jesse, what was also running parallel with Robinhood were SPACs in the early stages of the, the pandemic. And we saw faces such as Chama P, who really came out and stamped his name, his backing, if you will, for so many of these ventures. What is your opinion on SPACs and on meme stocks? I mean, and I'm asking this because we saw some unusual things which we touched on during the heat of the pandemic in the early stages where we saw GameStop and SPACs and meme stocks, meme cryptos. I mean, does this say anything about the markets and investors? Well, you know, I think SPACs are another thing that have already come under a great deal of scrutiny. I think the SEC has come out and really kind of put the kibosh on on uh, SPAC issuance and and promotion and these types of things. And I think it's going to be another thing that after the next bear market we're going to have congressional hearings and, you know, about should these things ever be allowed in the first place. And, you know, my real problem with SPACs is you can look at all different types of investment vehicles and um, hedge funds are, are, are one vehicle that without even 
putting up, you know, stellar performance or even mediocre performance, it's a way to make the hedge fund manager massively wealthy. Basically, if you gather enough assets under management and you do 5 to 10% per year over a number of years, your performance fees alone, 20% of profits or whatever, are going to make you very, very wealthy. Uh, SPACs are even, um, you know, uh, I think more attractive to those on Wall Street looking to enrich themselves, potentially at the expense of shareholders because uh, you gather, you know, a bunch of money to create some kind of acquisition. And uh, for, you know, very little upfront investment, the, the manager of the SPAC uh, gets 20% ownership in the, the, the final company um, and has zero downside and plenty of upside. So it's similar, similar to a hedge fund um, with the, you know, exception that uh, basically you're gifting, you know, 20% of the, the existing capital to the manager itself. And so I think you've seen, you know, anybody and any, everybody who's been able to raise money via SPAC has, has done it because it's essentially, a, a, you know, a, a no lose situation for SPAC sponsors. Yeah. How true that is. Old school investing used to be about finding undervalued gems, taking a position and, and then you wait a little bit. Do you see this trend now where retail investors are largely looking for quick gains with little consideration to risk management? And, and they're often just not interested in undervalued sectors due to impatience. Well, the thing you mentioned there, I think, is you know risk management. If there is one thing that I can emphasize to all of these new traders, it's risk management. I don't care how you trade, what you buy. If you implement effective risk management, you can be successful. Um, you know, I, I, I have my own way of doing things, which is kind of the old school way. I'm trying to find things that are trading at a discount to their intrinsic value because I believe in the margin of safety concept. That's me. Well, you know, a lot of people today think, you know, that's boring as hell. I have no idea, no interest in, in, in following your footsteps, Jesse. I'd rather buy you know, cryptocurrencies or, you know, trade NFTs, you know, these types of things. I think that's all fine and good as long as you implement some type of risk management. Um, it's critical, especially when you're trading in these things that are extremely high beta. Uh, and, and so because, I, you know, watching these cycles um, that I've seen, uh, you know, over time, um, that that's the one thing that could really save people from a lot of pain is is just having some type of risk management. Now, having said that, there really is no way to have any to implement any kind of risk management process when you're buying weekly call options that are that are far out of the money. They're very likely to lose you know all their value over the next over a period of three four days or however long you know before they expire. Um, but for those, you know, trading Tesla, trading Plug Power, buying, you know, the ARK Innovation Fund, a lot of these popular favorites today, just understanding, having a plan for when to sell can be very, very valuable. That's another great point. You posted a tweet recently quoting a Bloomberg article which said that there is a 96% historical probability of down markets in the next 12 months at current levels. Do you share this view and how far down could the markets go in this plunge? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because you asked earlier about quantifying sentiment. And this comes from uh, uh, a sentiment indicator, um, Tobias Levkovich's uh, you know, panic euphoria model when he was at City. And I think they've they've recently renamed it in his honor. He sadly passed away a few weeks ago. I think they've, they've renamed it the Levkovich you know, in, indicator. Um, and it basically is a sentiment indicator, um, but it's one of the best because it correlates directly to stock market performance 12 months out. And so that euphoria measure hit a, a higher peak in the beginning of this year. It peaked around the same time um, that we saw all these other sentiment things I was talking about, peak, GameStop, and all these other stocks. Um, peaked earlier in the year at a, at a high that was higher than the peak set at the peak of the dot-com mania in March of 2000. So that tells you that euphoria was even more extreme in this recent run-up than it was during that, that speculative mania. But it's rolled over, but it's still at a level that is associated with losses in the stock market 12 months forward. 
So I, I think that is, you know, you asked before how to quantify that. Uh, I think that's the way to do that. Um, uh, but I, but I do think yes, we are likely because of the technical setup, because of the monetary setup, those two, you know, two things that we are seeing. It's a very, very uh, uh, dangerous time in the stock market right now. Another thing that I pointed out uh, in a recent blog post is uh, we're potentially, I think we're probably headed for an earnings recession next year, which would, you know, the stock market typically tries to discount these things six to 12 months out. So that would be right about now. If we're going to see an earnings recession next summer, around next summer, Q2, Q3 of next year, stock market would be starting to try and discount that today. The reason I believe we're going to see an earnings recession is uh, S&P 500 earnings are very negatively correlated to a composite of oil prices, interest rates, and the dollar. When you see oil prices, interest rates, and the dollar all go up, about two years later, you see a dramatic decline in earnings and, and vice versa. When you see oil prices, I mean, this is why we've seen, one of the reasons why we've seen earnings just surge in, you know, over the last couple of quarters, earnings look fantastic because we had that crash and oil prices went negative, interest rates went to the lowest levels in history and the dollar plunged. And so it all set the stage for a boom in earnings. Now we're seeing that boom, but now that oil prices, interest rates, and the dollar have been really strong, uh, it sets the stage for uh, for a decline in earnings. So I, I think you have that fundamental backdrop, which is very negative for earnings, paired with monetary policy and the technicals that we talked about. It's it all kind of creates a, a you know witch's brew of you know kind of bearish implications. Interesting point again. You know, Jesse, when this decline comes, the anxiety, the denial, and the fear stages, how are they going to look like? I mean, how many investors out there will be brave enough to cut their losses versus not wanting to realize their losses and holding on to losing positions? Well, sadly, you know, that's, uh, you know, that's why I tried to make such a strong point about risk management is, is I think you what you see in bear markets are, you know, through those denial stages and those uh, you, you see investors say, well, if I just hang on, um, there was a book that came out uh, and I haven't read the book. So I'm, you know, this is really just a superficial take about it. But one of the things that marked the peak in 2000 was the popularity of this new book, uh, Dow 36,000. The Dow was around 10,000 at the time. And so it was kind of an outlandish thing to recommend to say the Dow is going to go from 10,000 to 36,000. Um, it, you know, essentially there now, but it's taken, you know, 20 years instead of the three, four, five years or whatever that, uh, you know, people believed was going to happen uh, because of the, you know, past performance of, of the Dow. Uh, a, a book that just came out recently uh, carries the title, Just Keep Buying. And to me, that's another symbol that investors have this mindset of buy the dip. And it's become so ingrained that as long as I just keep buying and I never sell, you know, I'll be okay. And it's that type of mindset to me that signals, you know, sentiment is in an unhealthy place because there's always a time to sell. You always have to have sell dips and you also always have to have risk management. I don't care if you're a trader or a long-term investor. If you don't have a sell discipline, you're, you're, you're asking for trouble. And, and, and so I, I do think that, it, you know, it's sad but true what you see in bear markets is investors hang on, hang on, hang on, and they don't sell, they don't capitulate until the very, the very bottom. I think you saw that in 2009 when the stock market made its bottom in early 2009. People finally capitulated, sold, I'll never buy stocks again as long as I live. And that's usually a great buy signal. I mean, it's sad how it, wor it works that way, but that's usually the same thing with real estate, residential real estate in 2011, 12. You had so many people, you know, getting foreclosed on and it's, it's uh, ter terribly tragic. But, you know, they go back to renting and say, I'll never buy a house again as long as I live. And that's a terrific buy signal. But that it's that capitulation that usually marks the lows. It's not you know people selling necessarily during the during the decline. Uh, it, it's a sad fact of, of bear markets that the average investor, the retail investor, holds holds through the entire decline. Okay, you know Jesse, with more chatter coming out about concerns of high inflation in the real economy, like grocery and everyday product 
prices, do you think the Fed will do a Volcker like move at some point like they did in the 80s with the drastic rate hike to rein inflation in? I think they may be forced to at some point in the future, but I don't think there's any way they're going to do it anytime soon. I, I think right now the Fed has made it very clear that uh, they have this dual mandate, full employment and stable prices. This is what Congress has mandated the Fed, you know, be in charge of. And I think they've made it very, very clear uh, that the full employment side of the mandate takes precedence over the stable prices side. And so to the extent when, you know, the Fed has said, we're going to start tapering, then we're going to start raising interest rates. I think the, the betting markets are now pricing in at least two interest rate hikes before the end of next year, uh, if not three. Um, uh, I, I don't think that's probably going to happen. I don't even think they're going to be able to taper completely because 2018 was a great example, right? Jay Powell came in um, as head of the Fed and said, we're going to raise interest rates. We're going to normalize monetary policy. He got the Fed funds rate to, what was it, 2%, 2.5%. And he said, we're nowhere near neutral, implying that they're going to have to raise rates a lot more than that. Stock market in the fourth quarter of 2018 tanked, went down almost 20%. And the Fed completely reversed course, so we're going to stop hiking rates. They eventually had to go back to buy, you know, uh, stepping back into the Treasury market in 2019 after the repo fiasco. And, and to me, that was another sign that the, the Treasury market has just gotten too big. We've issued too much debt for the Fed to step away completely. The market, the market can't function without the Fed. I think probably for the rest of our lifetimes, the Fed is going to have to be involved in the smooth functioning of the treasury market. So there's going to come a time where they start tapering assets, asset purchases, stock market. I mean, we're already seeing the, I think that the bond market test the Fed's resolve by, you know, interest rates have been going up since they said they're going to taper. Nominal rates have been going up. Rates are going to go up to a point where the mortgage market is really going to take a hit. Potentially real estate prices, you know, could, could weaken. Uh, and that's a that would be a big threat to the economy, but probably even more frightening to the Fed would be another sell off in the stock market because they know that uh, consumer psychology is now so tight today more than ever is so tied to asset prices. So if if consumers start to feel stock markets going down, real estate prices are weakening, the economy is going to follow, and and there's no way the Fed is going to risk crash crashing the stock market. And crashing the economy in 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 order to try and rein in inflation, at least not right now. I think down the road, you know, like Paul Tudor Jones, I think said this week, uh, they're going to be they're telling you we're going to be way behind the curve. But at some point, somebody's going to have to come in at the Fed and put the hammer down. Um, I just think that time is probably well off into the future. Okay, hey, Jesse, how about precious metals? Where are precious metals in this market cycle? Man, I, you know, there was a John Hathaway, uh, it was a great article uh, in the Financial Times this week in terms of where we are in the sentiment cycle of precious metals. John Hathaway, uh, you know, fund manager for Sprott, said that, uh, told Financial Times, there is zero interest in their strategies right now. <laughs> Not, I mean, I can't think of a more bullish, uh, uh, you know, uh, setup. For, for precious metals than what we're seeing today. I love the fact that the market is coming to the conclusion, the appropriate conclusion, that inflation is not transitory. The next step is the Fed, that the market's gonna come to the conclusion is that the Fed is really powerless to do anything about it because they can't crash the stock market. They can't afford to crash the economy in you know in their uh, efforts towards reigning in inflation and so when the market comes to that realization when investors fund managers come to that conclusion the interest in john hathaway's type of strategies you know gold mining stocks and these is going to really surge because people are going to realize okay wait inflation is not only transitory the Fed, the Fed's hands are tied in doing anything about it. I have to shift my portfolio in favor of uh, that. I think the B of A survey this week was really interesting to see. Uh, the the fund managers survey of fund managers showed 
the largest underweight in bonds in the history of the survey. So clearly, fund managers are saying, okay, inflation is here. It's probably here to stay for a while. I don't want to own bonds. That's why they don't want to buy gold either, because they really do believe interest rates are just going to go straight up from here. Now, I don't think that's that's going to happen. I think probably you already see uh, an extreme bearishness in, in the bond market um, that that suggests interest rates are probably near their highs in the short term. Uh, but when fund managers realize, OK, wait, the Fed can't raise interest rates uh, and so interest rates can't go higher then uh, that's super bullish for precious metals because I think that's that's what's holding people back from precious metals. They think we're in this tightening cycle and interest rates are going to go way up. That's not good for precious metals. But I think we're going to have negative real rates for an extended period of time, probably a decade plus. If that's the case, if, if the market comes around, in my view, you know, gold price, silver prices are going to have to be much, much higher than they are today. What other markets do you think will do well in the coming years? Well, I've been bullish on uh, energy, traditional energy commodities for at least the past year. Uh, I, I, I wrote about that you know, last summer, the generational opportunity in commodities. I do think we are in the early stages of a commodity super cycle, and energy is the bit, you know, you know, my favorite way to play that. It's just a function of investment. When you see investment dollars go into a sector, returns go down. Um, in the in the coming years, uh, and vice versa. When you see investment come out of a sector, returns go up because you know supply follows investment. So you invest a ton of money in the oil and gas sector, like we saw in the early in the, you know early 2010s after the financial crisis. Cheap capital allowed the you know energy companies to start fracking oil. Uh, supplies went through the roof, energy price crashed, oil prices crashed in 2015. Since 2015, investment in, in energy has gone uh, gone away entirely. So you can be pretty sure that new supply is not going to come on. We have the demand now hitting from a reopening of economies around the world. There's no supply, supply demand, energy is going through the roof. Um, but we've seen this in, in precious metals for a long time. To, after the 2011, 12, 13, 14 crash in precious metals, investment in the sector has you know disappeared. And so when demand really hits in precious metals, there's just not going to be the supplies there. And so I think we're going to see some, you know precious metals kind of do what what energy, you know, what we're seeing in natural gas and copper and these types of things. Commodities are still a very interesting play generally. Uh, but I think also, one of the most interesting areas in the stock market today, and this is really hard for a lot of people to invest in, uh, which is why it's still undervalued, is I think that you know the the U.S. cannabis sector, these uh, multi-state operators, uh, are are growing like crazy. You have this as the as uh, cannabis is legalized in the United States, um, it's uh, these companies are 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 literally seeing explosive revenue growth. They're super highly profitable. Essentially, they're just as profitable and growing just as fast as the big tech stocks in the United States, but they trade at a dramatic discount in terms of valuations because cannabis is still federally illegal in the United States. And so these stocks trade as, uh, you know, on the pink sheets as essentially Canadian ADRs. And so the vast majority of institutional investors can't buy them for compliance reasons and all these types of things. So there's demand for the shares has been dramatically curtailed in kind of a, you know, uh, uh, you know, just a regulatory fashion. But I think once cannibal, you know, once cannabis is, is uh, made federally legal, investors are, you know, these things are going to be added to indexes and uh, institutional investors are going to look at them and say, wow, these things are growing 20, 30, 40, 50%, I mean, 100% a year in a lot of cases in terms of revenue growth, and they have huge gross margins. We have to have exposure here. Today, I think you can buy these stocks uh, you know, before institutions are, are able to get, uh, get their hands on them. And it's one of those rare opportunities, I think, in the market today where you have fa a fast-growing, highly profitable sector trading at uh, a pretty cheap price. Ten years ago, even five years ago, would you have been telling people to go ahead and take a look at cannabis? 
No, and actually even two years ago, I think I wrote a piece saying stay away. Uh, and it was because I think a lot of the Canadian um, operators were really the popular names. Um, you looked at, you know, the Robin Hood, uh, you know, most popular stocks, and a lot of them were, you know, like, uh, um, uh, you know, these, these Canadian names, which really went into a bubble. And they became so popular, the stocks, you know, uh, went, went to the moon, and then now they've crashed 80, you know, 90% in value plus. But those stocks really aren't as profitable as these, these multi-state operators. These companies, um, there's a handful of them in the United States that have been granted state licenses. Uh, and it's almost like a duopoly, monopoly type situation where they have 50% market share in a state like Florida, a company like Trulieve, um, you know, and they're acquiring other multi-state operators and expanding into other states. And, uh, you know, building a brand and it's, it's you know, really early days in these things. I, I never thought I would have imagined um, investing in these things, but they really are, do meet a mar that margin of safety standard. They're, they're value stocks and growth stocks at the same, same time, which is a situation you, you rarely find in markets. Okay, getting high on cannabis stocks. Wow. <laughs> Jesse Felder, before we wrap up, can you let our listeners know more about where they can find your work and your views? Yeah, sure. I, I try and put out uh, either a blog post or a podcast once a week at thefelderreport.com. Right there on my website, I also put out a free Saturday morning uh, email. You can sign up right there on the homepage. Um, that email is basically just the five most interesting things I found during the week, whether it's a link or a chart or a uh, video. Um, I send that out on Saturday mornings. Um, I'm also pretty active on Twitter, at Jesse Felder. Pretty much just tweet a lot of the most interesting things I'm reading during the course of the week. Okay, Jesse Felder, we appreciate the time you've given. We'll keep an eye on gold, and hopefully we can do this again soon. Thanks, Patrick. It was a pleasure being with you again. That was Jesse Felder sharing his views on the economy and what we might be looking at ahead. To see more of Jesse's work, go to thefelderreport.com. If you like this video, please subscribe, share, and give it a thumbs up. It helps us to continue to do what we do. And as a reminder, audio-only versions can be found on iTunes and Spotify. 